It is indeed a privilege to be here this morning. Let us go to God in prayer. Sovereign Lord and Master of all, we honor you for this privilege of pausing from life's busyness to acknowledge your kingship, to celebrate you, and to reflect upon how we can become better in our service to hum humanity through serving you. Grant us now, dear God, receptive hearts, and by your grace, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Those of you who know me well know that I am excited about life in general. And I listened and participated in the service so far this morning, full of energy, full of life. And I asked myself this question, how many of us have taken the time to really reflect upon this wonderful privilege that God has granted us of life? How many of us have taken time this morning to really, once we recognize that we are conscious, we have breath in our bodies, to say, God, I thank you for this gift of life. And so just to be sure that in spite of everything that has happened here today, none of us leaves here without giving God thanks for life. Let us all just say together, Lord, I thank you for this gift of life. Again, Lord, I thank you for this gift of life. Amen. We must never, ever take the gift of life for granted. Every day we wake up, seems almost, you hear of another murder, another death somewhere, someone who you know and love and cared for is no longer physically present with you. So we must not, never, ever take for granted this life which God has given us. Amen? When the cabinet secretary asked me to deliver a sermon at today's church service, my first response was, I have done that already. And she said, really, in this recent, since it has been reorganized, said, I don't remember how recent, it actually was in 2004, but I, I thought somebody else should be given the opportunity so to do. But when it comes to doing God's work, who am I? Who am I to say that I don't want to do that? So here I am with you in the service today. The organizers of this year's public service activities have chosen the theme, Productivity and Service Excellence in the Public Service. And no one can take an issue with that theme. To the extent that we see ourselves as providing vital, even if paid, services to the people of this country, aiming to be productive and to do so with excellence is not only laudable, but also necessary and desirable. Some persons may argue that as a public servant, there are so many obstacles which prevent or make it difficult for us as public servants today to efficiently carry out our task. That is understandable, because in life, there are some persons who, as the Prime Minister was indicating, find all of the difficulties and the challenges, the way I have coined it, 
is that there are some persons who have a problem for every solution. It matters not what suggestions are made to improve on something. There are those who will be able to find a reason why it cannot or must not be done. You know, sometime last year, the Prime Minister of this country reminded me of a speech given in 1910 by Franklin Roosevelt. And so since then, I've read and examined that speech in great detail. And so as I was reflecting on the fact that some people always have a problem for every solution, I thought of these words by Roosevelt. It is not the quick critic who conks, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is mad by dust and sweat and blood. Those words, I think, constitute the best response to those who find it difficult to strive for excellence in the public service. Let us, as a public service, not be afraid in the midst of criticism, apprehension, and cynicism to strive always by the help of God and firmly grounded in our faith to seek to address the problems of this country. We owe it to the younger generations and to the generations unborn, so to do. But I wanted to share with you a little part of a story from the Bible also today. It would be past strange if you asked someone who has, who professes their faith in God, who is a local preacher of, listen to this, 35 years, it would be past strange if I just came up and shared general inspirational points with you. So I want to share a little story which is very well known and to see how today we can as a public service, gather some inspiration and do better our work than we are doing today. Most of us as, as people in general, when we were young and going to Sunday school, we became familiar with the story of Joseph, not so? Usually, we associate the story with Joseph, this young man who had a coat of a coat of many colors. So this story is quite interesting and quite well known. We are also, in fact, we like very often to quote from some aspects of this story. If we look at Genesis chapter 51, for example, and verse 12, when Joseph eventually, after all the drama and excitement of his life, when he eventually comes face to face with his brothers, what did he say? That you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. So we are familiar. We quote that often. The aspect of the story which I share today, however, is that part when Joseph was a servant in Potiphar's house. Potiphar was an official in Egypt, and Joseph worked for him. So in a sense, we are working for our, our country. Joseph was working for his master, Potiphar. To be sure, I do not suggest that as public servants, our status is analogous with that of Joseph. But 
This is an interesting point that we find in Genesis chapter 39 and verse 4. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care, meaning to Joseph's care, everything he owned. Joseph had significant responsibilities. Do I see some permanent secretaries here today? Joseph had significant responsibilities. He was in charge of something. He was responsible for everything in Potiphar's house. Many of us as public servants here this morning are responsible for something. In our ministry, in our department, in our unit. The Honorable Prime Minister is responsible for everything in his cabinet. He is responsible for everything relating to the economy of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. His ministers and parliamentary secretary, they are responsible for everything within their ministerial portfolios. And their permanent secretaries and heads of departments are responsible for everything that comes within their sphere. Genesis 39, chapter, six, verse, chapter 39, verse 6 tells us that Potiphar left everything that he had in Joseph's care. And with Joseph in charge, he, Potiphar, did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Isn't that remarkable? He was unconcerned because clearly he had absolute confidence and trust in Joseph. As a public servant of whatever position, of whatever rank, can we say that our superiors are so content, are so satisfied with our efficiency with the work that we do that they can leave it entirely up to us. I got the impression that Potiphar was so satisfied with the efficient manner in which Joseph carried out his work, his duties, that he did not constantly have to and he certainly did not constantly check up to see how things were going. He trusted Joseph. He was satisfied perhaps because he too could have seen that the Lord was present with Joseph. I do not believe that there was anything extraordinary that Joseph had done, quite frankly, except maintain an unshakable faith in his God in trying and difficult circumstances. Joseph had, as we well know, a riveting story. And I believe that each of us present here this morning has a story. Sometimes I speak to colleagues in the public service. Some persons feel aggrieved. Some persons feel that they have not been treated fairly. In 2008, I chaired a reclassification appeals committee, a committee which was appointed by cabinet to examine the numerous complaints which were made after the last reclassification exercise. That our committee, we received appeals from 792 in respect of 700 and 92 positions within the public service. And we made recommendations for the reconsideration of the classification in a number of cases. Today, so many years later, there are some persons who still meet me and ask about their status. So you may feel that you, you may feel today that you have a legitimate 
reason for concern. You may feel that you have a legitimate grouse. You may feel aggrieved. Joseph did. But because of Joseph's unwavering faith in God, he persevered and earned the complete trust of his master. So my dear public servants, permit me to ask you this simple question. Are you persevering in your particular situation in spite of your story? In spite of the ways in which you may feel that you are aggrieved? Can your boss trust you completely? If not, ask yourself, why not? And today, make a determination in your heart to change that. Most of us like stories with happy endings. And it would have been nice if this aspect of the Joseph story ended right at this point, where Joseph trusted and his boss appeared to be happy. But we know that that's not what happened in this particular case. And we know that life is really not like that. Life is usually not that straightforward. According to Genesis 39 and 7, Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of him and said, come to bed with me. This is problematic in any situation. Sexual indiscretion has always been and continues to be a problem for mankind. It is rooted in the sins of lust and greed, among others. What is important for us to note here this morning as public servants is not the problem of lust or greed and desire for what does not belong to us. It is the way in which we handle those problems when they arise. As public servants, we can be sure that problems and challenges will arise from time to time. And so, from a biblical perspective, what we need to seek to do is to see how we handle ourselves when problems arise. What are the lessons, now you may ask, that we can learn from the way Joseph responded to some of the sticky situations as they arose in his life? In this particular passage in, in Genesis 39, 1 to 12, I want to point out three important characteristics in the way in which Joseph responded. Joseph responded courageously. Joseph responded courageously. Secondly, Joseph responded in a way which kept his integrity intact. And thirdly, Joseph did not compromise. He, he responded courageously. He maintained his integrity and he did not compromise. Some of you may be thinking, even as you listen to my voice now, that it is all well and good for her to say, for me to stand here and pontificate about courage and integrity and compromise. And you might even be saying, as some persons have said, that she has had it easy. So she can speak about courage and integrity and about compromise. I want to say that in my public service career, I have had the tremendous privilege and mostly joy, mostly, of working for three of our country's four prime ministers doing the same job. 
it, and now I just, I think perhaps they just wanted to test and see if I can work for somebody other than a prime minister. They have given me a minister. So now I'm working for a fourth person, first time, not, who is not the prime minister. And it would be strange if after 30 years, I have not encountered situations which required me to act courageously. In such situations, when they arose, and when you realize that it needed courage, which I myself, in my own strength, do not possess, I have often gone into meetings, into discussions, into situations, armed with the words of David, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He has, he, he the Lord, will not suffer my foot to be moved. He that keeps me will not slumber. No, he will neither slumber nor sleep. I know that in those situations that I have experienced, I can tell you that I have affirmed over and over that the Lord is my keeper. The Lord is the shade upon my right hand. And I know deep within my heart in those difficult situations that required me to be courageous, that the sun shall not smite me by day, nor the moon by night, and that the Lord, my God, in whom I have placed and continue to place my trust, will preserve me from all evil. He will preserve my soul. He will preserve my going out and my coming in, not sometimes, but all the times. And so, I urge you as fellow public servants, it takes courage, it takes tremendous courage to do the right thing, not sometimes, but all the time. But we do not possess this courage on our own strength. When <clears throat> we trust in God. He gives us, he empowers us with the courage that we need. And so as we call upon his name, we do, we are enabled to do the right by ourselves, our consciences, and for our country. Need I, need I say anything about integrity and compromise? When Potiphar's wife attempted to seduce Joseph, his response was clear. He said, no. My master has put me in charge. No, he doesn't have to worry about anything in the house. He trusts me to take care of everything he owns. No one in this house is higher in a higher position than I am. My master, says Joseph, hasn't held anything back from me except you. But you are his wife. How could I do an evil thing like that? How could I sin against God? How could I sin against God? To my mind, this is all the reminder that we as public servants need to keep our integrity in check. That is all it takes for us to avoid compromising ourselves. I have seen, as some of you have seen, over the years in the public service, people who have fallen from grace, 
because they have succumbed and compromised themselves. The ubiquity of seductive behavior within the public service is shameful. And colleagues, I urge you, if you are involved in this type of misconduct, stop it. It is inappropriate and it is, a, it is sin. How could we sin against God? Unfortunately, I want to say that seduction which causes us in the public service to compromise our principles and values and in the process affect the laudable goals of achieving productivity and service excellence is not the only problem within the public service. Take, for example, the disdain that we have in general for timekeeping at work. And you know, we say, time is money. Isn't that so? And yet, as public servants, we indulge in so much time wasting when we eventually turn up. It is a disgrace. In my own ministry, recently I had a conversation with an officer who had over a two-month period been absent for 15 days, one five. In having this conversation, this officer who proclaims like many of us in here to be Christian could not understand my being so upset. 15 days in two months, that amounts to thousands of dollars that we steal from the public purse. Because if we say that time is money, and we absent ourselves, or we are habitually late, or when we turn up, we are not working as our contract stipulates, then effectively, we are no better than someone who has contrived a plan to steal money in a big way. Many of us public servants, we maintain that we are Christians. We hold on to the Bible. And so I thought to myself, but if we are Christians, why are we not like Christians. Some years ago, I read a book called Christian Atheist. And I found the title quite intriguing because I said there is a contradiction of sorts. Eh? You can't be a Christian and an atheist at the same time. So I delved into the book and the author, who is a pastor, he was writing after experiences of his congregations. They believed. They said, yes, pastor, we believe in God. But everything about their lives, trusting in God, depending upon God, there was always fear and extra worry, like all of us. We worry about everything. So, I think in the public service, we behave very much like Christian atheists. There is something that the technical people call rent-seeking behavior and moonlighting within the public service. How can we achieve excellence? How can we deliver A good product when we ensure that opportunity, we create opportunities for rent seeking and moonlighting. 
That's just a terminology for corruption in public life. And you may think, if you are involved therein, you may think that you are temporarily, you may, you may think that you are getting away with it. But my advice to you this morning is that apart from making the job of management of the economy that much more of a challenge, it is it also your moonlighting and rent seeking behavior also places us in a more difficult situation with regard to our testimony and our faith. If we say that we are Christians, then we should not be afraid. Some persons say, well, we have to do something on the side because you know the economy, you know things are tight, things are not right. So we have to do something to make ends meet. And we forget that in the book of Isaiah, chapter 40 and verse 31, we are reminded that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not get tired. They shall walk and not become weary. Let us, my fellow public servants, learn to wait upon God. As Christians within a public service which is striving for excellence, let us act like Christians. This means that we are avoiding lewd, vulgar conduct which manifests in the things, and our Christianity, by the way, should naturally be manifest in the things that we do. We should exhibit or allow our Christianity to be shown in all situations, in all circumstances. Like Joseph, we can be public servants and act courageously. We can act with integrity and we can avoid compromising ourselves and our country. You might think it is difficult. You might think it is a challenge. But I stand here as a testimony to you that it can be done. Challenges will arise. And you will have bad days. But by God's grace, we can do it. I want to thank you for listening. And it is my prayer this morning that through God's Son, Jesus Christ, we will have the courage. We will not be afraid. If we have not as yet accepted Jesus Christ into our lives, that we would not be afraid today to say, today is the day. Today is the day that I will ask Jesus personally to come into my life and to make him Lord and Savior. We might be thinking right now, that there are so many things that we need to change about how we operate as a public servant before we can take Jesus Christ seriously. But I urge you that you need not wait. This may be your last opportunity. And I invite you to give your life to Jesus today. Amen.